Well, good morning. Good morning to everyone. My name is uh, Don King, and I get the pleasure of uh, welcoming you this morning and uh, kind of transitioning into our worship service. Um, if you're new here, we, uh, we're just happy you're here and, and hope that you feel most welcome uh, here. There's someone at, at a life group I think will be manning our information booth in back, by the way. So if you have any questions about what's happening here at Emmanuel, uh, please stop back at the information booth. You know, I was asked to share uh, something from Scripture that sort of resonates about who God is. And so I selected uh, Psalm 8. And I'm going to be asking you for some help. Uh, Psalm 8, there's a few things I'd love to say. First, Psalm 8 is a, uh, it, it's one of the very few songs in the Bible that's a direct address to God. You know, and you think about how much we talk about God, but the question is, how often do we talk to God? And Psalm 8 is, uh, is that talking to God. And so uh, you're going to hear this psalmist pray in a direct address. And I want to I give you, I pulled out a couple of things just to, just to talk about. First and foremost, Psalm 8 is uh, it's about a personal God. So in the Bible where you read in the English, Lord, behind that is the Hebrew personal name for God, which is not the general name for God, which is typically back in those days was Elohim, El, God, Elohim. The personal name that Jews would say Adonai, if you translate or look at the actual Hebrew, it's Yahweh. That's a personal name for God. And you know, John uh, says, uh, in his gospel, you know, the word became flesh and walked among us. You know, we have a personal savior in Jesus Christ. And so the personal nature is God is, is powerful. And I think Psalm 8 speaks to that. Also wanted to, uh, there's a author named David Taylor, and I have one of his books on the Psalms that I love. And he says, it's as if the poet was purposefully striking a single key on the piano over and over when the poet refers to your fingers, talking to God again, your fingers and your hands, which result in creation of your heavens, a reflection of your glory and your name. And so in Psalm 8, and how you, you will help me is, uh, in Psalm 8, you're going to hear the refrain, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So when you hear me say, Lord, our Lord, I'm asking you to say, how majestic is your name in all the earth? And we'll pray this together, and then we'll, we'll worship together. Are you ready? Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, Lord, our Lord. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's rise and worship together. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free. Place for me, I'm a 
the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of the day. chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. That's us. I am chosen. I am who you say I am. You are for me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Will you confess with me? Lord God, right now we ask you to come, your Holy Spirit, to come in our midst, Lord, and convict us of the sin that's in our life, and also to convict us of your love for us. Lord, we're all just a mess. Our relationships get messed up. Our lives get messed up. We're not the people that you want us to be. We are not able to love each other the way that you want us to. Lord, we can't do it without your Holy Spirit in our lives. Only you have the power to change us to create us to be like you, Lord. More and more like Jesus every day in a process that goes on through eternity, Lord. Let's take a moment to confess silently. we give you these things that are weighing on our heart and we know that you will take them Lord and throw them far away in the farthest ocean because you have redeemed us through Jesus we praise you for that in Jesus name amen brothers and sisters you can be assured that because of Jesus your sins are forgiven amen Colossians 2 tells us when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away and nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. song it is well.
Because of what Jesus did. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. has quaked before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard and through it all through it all my eyes are on and through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. Be it for me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Try. 
is wise with me. Let's continue to worship the Lord as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Well, can you bless it? Good morning, Emmanuel. well. Amen. It is well with our soul because of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you are new here, uh, my name is John. I serve on the team and we take this moment to this time to continue into worship in the Lord's Supper in Holy Communion. Getting a little feedback. I step back. You know, as Jesus sat at the table with his disciples on that, his, during the Last Supper, his last time having breaking bread with them, he, he took the bread, knowing his fate, knowing what, his, what was going to become of his body. He knew how badly he would be broken. Yet, he said, this bread represents my body. He took it, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. You know, there's not enough that can be said about the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's by his blood, it's because of his blood, it's through his blood that we're healed, that we're saved, that we're redeemed, that we're restored, that, that families are reconciled. It's the name and the blood of Jesus that we pray over things, over our lives, over circumstances. So if you've come in here, before we go in, if you've come in here with a, with a heaven, heavy burden or feels like something in your life isn't right, as you come forward for communion, pray, this, pray the blood of Jesus over the circumstance. Pray the blood of Jesus over your life. Pray the blood of Jesus over your family line and your generational line. Because Jesus said, this cup, which represents the new covenant, the promise that I'm making with my dad, with my father, God himself, this blood, he took it, he gave thanks, he said, take and drink, this is my blood, which will be shed for you and for, for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this in remembrance of me. Now will you join me in the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not due to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Please come forward and receive communion. The 
sound of heaven touching earth, the spirit break out. Break our walls down. Spirit break out. Heaven come down. Spirit break out, break our walls down. Spirit break out, heaven come down. Amen. It was, uh, my, I mentioned Friedrich Nietzsche is a philosopher, late 19th century philosopher. He died in 1899, who was the founder of what we know now as uh, nihilism. How many of you have heard that term nihilism before? It comes from the, it comes from the Latin word nihilo, which means nothing. So it's a, it's a philosophy, essentially. It's kind of a weird name for a philosophy because it means nothingism. But what I did like about him even though he's a Lutheran pastor's kid who is the darling of all the, the modern atheistic movements, 
Nietzsche uh, had a criticism, he, obviously, for the theological worldview because he, he loudly proclaimed, I can't remember what work it's in, uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra, that, that, that God is dead. And he wasn't proclaiming like a Christian aspect of how Jesus died on the cross. He was saying that the concept of God with people as we progress in, into, a, in a, into increasingly further technological age, that the concept of God as something above us who guarantees us eternal life and heaven and watches over the things of this world, he says, that's, that's gone. That, that God, is now, God is dead and we have killed him by our technological advances. And the only place that people like us Christians can retreat into is what philosophers have called the God of the gaps. Have you heard of this before? Things that science can't explain yet, and we say, well, that's God. It's so you put God into these gaps of things we can't explain. But Nietzsche was also increasingly critical also of what he considered the, the, the rational enlightenment scientific point of view. So he thought theology, religion, and even the enterprise of science were equally untrue, he says, because even science, like religion, claims that there's an ideal truth for something. That there is, there is an answer, that you could seek truth, that you could seek, am I okay back there? How am I sounding? <laughs> All right. Um, so he, he criticized the theological worldview as well as the rational scientific worldview because he thought they both were appealing to a standard of truth. And he says, if there is nothing above us that we could appeal to, that there is no, th therefore, there is no such thing as truth that we could equally appeal to. Does this make sense? Thus thus nihilism. And so he was, there's lots of people that were his little acolytes subsequent to his life and during his life that would pro loudly proclaim that they were atheistic, that God is dead, that there is no such thing as God, he said, and then they would, they would turn the other cheek and say that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't engage in oppression and we should care for the poor and we should stand up for people's rights while all the while claiming a secularistic, materialist worldview. And do you know what he called them? He says, your closet Christians is all you are. Because you want the worldview that Christianity gave to the world, which is, yes, we should care for the poor, we should care for the oppressed and the disenfranchised and the, the, the marginalized, because those are people that Jesus died for. He says, that's a Christian worldview. You've got to understand that. You, have, you, you claim to have an atheistic foundation, but you have a Christian worldview. And he says, you're, you're, you're nothing but, you're nothing but closet, closet Christians, which is one of the reasons I appreciate Nietzsche, because he was the one at least to embrace the consequences of the statement that if there is no God, then all bets are off, then every, everything is permitted. Everything is permitted, because there's no one who could say right and wrong if there's no standard above us. Uh, I appreciate him, because most modern-day materialists won't go to that length. They will say, I don't believe in a God, however, we should live in a certain way. Well, that's, that's, called, <laughs> that's called incoherent, right? You can't, this is what I believe, but I can't live according to the pattern of what I believe. That's, called, that's, that's incoherent. Nonetheless, when you come to Christianity, I like to say, well, not me, but the Bible says this, that Nietzsche is exactly right about about the world and about our universe if there is nothing above us. That's very much true. It's the strong eating the weak. That's all you have. And he said, and that's all history will be reduced to, is the, he said, is the strong eating the weak. Because there, if there is no such thing now as right and wrong and good and evil, he wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil, if there is no such thing as right, wrong, and good and evil, then we have to determine right and wrong for ourselves. Well, who, the very, uh, there's a very good question if you propose that thesis that if we have to establish right and wrong for ourselves, my question would be, who gets to do that? <laughs> who gets to establish right and wrong? Who says that it's right? Who says that it's wrong? And he had a very simple answer for that. Any of you know what that was? The overman, the strong man, the ubermensch. Whoever's stronger gets to decide. You say, I think something is right. Another person says something is right. Well, who gets to decide? Whoever kills the other one. 
That's perfectly, that's, that's rational, right? And the strong man says what is right. And that's what you have, you're, he says that's what you're going to have subsequent to the death of God. And he predicted in a, in a way that almost ironically enough had to be divinely inspired. He died in 1899 and he predicted with the death of God invading our culture, he says, the concept of God gradually being displaced from the center of people's lives, which is very much true. He said the next century, which is the 20th century, he says will be the bloodiest one by a factor of 10 compared to the previous centuries of human existence. And he was exactly right. He says you can't pull the foundation out of morality from morality and expect people to behave moral. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote a little essay in the 19, middle of the 19, 20th century called Men Without Chests. <laughs> and he says, you know, in our, in our systems, our education, our philosophical systems, he says, we disparage, we disparage honor, we disparage patriotism, we, we disparage these things. He goes, and then we're surprised that we have traitors in our midst. <laughs> we, we disparage things like uh, the good and the ethical, and then we're shocked that when people behave badly and unethically. And he says, so what we're doing is, he says, Lewis says, we've ripped the heart out of the culture, and yet we still expect people to walk around like ethical people. That's why he called it men without chests. We want, we want the honorable behavior. We want people to behave, but you've ripped the foundation out. And now what do we, what do we have to live for? Now, see, if there's nothing above us, Nietzsche is exactly right, which is why we're doing this series uh, on on. It's called Logos, how to, how to think with, with a biblical logic from a biblical worldview. I saw a survey recently, and listen to these numbers, very interesting. Not surprising, but interesting nonetheless. Only 14% of Christians believe that Christianity exclusively provides the way to eternal life. So, in other words, 86% of Christians do not believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, which is a direct quote from his mouth. So, 86% of Christians, and what, what they think is that it, it, it's, it's a, if it works for you, <laughs> then that is, the, that is a good way. If it works for you, if it provides comfort, if it provides solace, then, yeah, that's fine. It is a way, a way of life. I like W.H. Auden. Uh, this resonates with me. He said... Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ because he fulfills none of my dreams. <laughs> because he is in every respect the opposite of what he would be if I could have made him in my own image. Thus, if a Christian is asked, why, not, why Jesus and not Socrates or Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad, perhaps all I can say is, none of those other figures arouse all sides of my being to cry, crucify him. Because... Auden believes in Jesus, he says, because Jesus fulfills none of my earthly or worldly desires. <laughs> He's the opposite of what I would have constructed had I, had I built a faith upon my own needs. And that's what's interesting, what the Bible tells us, in essence, is that you need a Savior that's not a product of your own needs. Otherwise, you just have a self-construction of yourself. And when you say Jesus is a way, what, in essence, are you saying? Well, you're saying if it works for you, but he is not the way, so therefore he's not above us, he's just a pathway that you could choose to follow if it makes you happy, obviously happiness being the ultimate goal. And the happiness is not the ultimate goal that God is looking, looking for for your life. You remember my quote that I love from C.S. Lewis? He said, if I wanted to be happy, I would have never have chose Christianity. He says, I, I know a good strong bottle of port wine could have made me happy. I didn't go to Christianity for happiness, I went to Christianity for truth. But sadly enough, he predicted, Lewis did, on another divinely inspired prophetic manner, he says that going into the future, people aren't going to be seeking truth for truth's sake, they're gonna seek truth for happiness sake. We're not on a truth quest anymore, we're on a happiness quest. And that's why you could see 86% of Americans could say, if it works for you. In other words, the other way to say it is, if Christianity makes you happy, Sure, <laughs> hey, all power to you. I was listening to a podcast, uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, and he had a guy on, and they started to talk about Jesus, and essentially, it was good up until this point, 
where Joe Rogan says, that's all fine if it works for you. And, and that guy's saying, yeah, that's all I'm saying is that this works for me. Well, if it's just something that works for me and is not a universal thing for everyone, then it's essentially, it's, it's in essence saying, it's nothing, correct? Are you, are you guys tracking with me? Then it is not, then it is not a way. It's just another self-help mechanism that helps you get along in life in order to make yourself happy. But what if God's goal for your life isn't your happiness? Have you ever thought about that? What if he's not about fulfilling all, every little wish that pops up into our, into our psychological mind or, or, or that's not a product of our sinful, perhaps our sinful heart and to affirm everyone and the lifestyle that they choose for one another? If God is real, I always like to say, wouldn't you have disagreements with him if God is actually real and you're living your life? What kind of relationship is it where, let's say this is a marriage and you have a relationship and you're, you're, you're living with one another and you're, you're caring for one another only so far as if you make me happy. Guys, gals, many of us have marriages like that. I, many of, I should say you, I don't, but... Uh, <laughs> What happens when you're not happy anymore? You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, we, well, then you, you discard the partner and look for a better one. It's the woman you gave me. You sound a lot like Adam in the garden at that point. And what I'm, what I'm calling for, I guess, is what the Bible calls for is that, like C.S. Lewis indicated, he said, we need to go, if, Go to truth for truth's sake, whether it makes you happy or not. And that means you would, if, if it's true, that means you have something that's above you, that's different than you, that may disagree with you. Well, I think the Bible's all well and good, but I don't like this aspect of the Bible, and I don't like that aspect about the Bible. You're just on a happiness quest then. You just, you, you will only worship a God so long as he agrees with you. And you know there's a really fundamental problem with that. I mean, fund, fundamental is a, a, a light way to put it. There's a, there's, a, there's a critical error to that way of thinking. Because if you have a God that only agrees with you, then there's no one to argue with you when you're in the pit of despair and depression and you hate yourself and you want to kill yourself. There's no one to disagree with you. That's a bad place to be in. And when you're too full of yourself and you think that you're the... The, the, the bee's knees, so to speak, there's no one to prick your bubble and to bring you back to reality. There's no one to disagree with you. So I like to say to people who say, the reason I'm not a Christian is because I disagree with X, Y, and Z about the Bible. I said, that's not a reason to not be a Christian. That's actually the foundational principle of, one of the foundational principles of being a Christian is that you find yourself in disagreement with him. So if you are flirting around the edges of Christianity, whether or not you want to commit your life to Christ, understand that disagreeing with the Bible and then ultimately submitting is, is the beginning of a, that's called a relationship. <laughs> and that's what God is after with us is not necessarily assent to doctrine, nodding our head to particular doctrines, but to experience the truth and be in a relationship where you're going to have disagreements. And ultimately, at some point in your Christian walk, it needs to be like what, like, like how we are with, like how I am with my children. You, uh, why? Why do I have to do that? I don't understand why I have to do that. How, how, come, how come you say we have to do this and not that? And I, at some point, you know, I like to give rational reasons, but it's, at some point, especially when time is of the essence, I just say, because I'm 47 and you're nine. That's why. <laughs> and with God, why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? There are some issues where he just says, because I'm infinite and omniscient, <laughs> and you're, you're not, because I have no age, and I'm, I am wisdom incarnate, and you're Dan Shaw. That's why. You're nine, right? So that's where the, it's not so much about happiness. I always like to say the Christian life isn't so much about happiness, but it is about joy, Right? And God, Jesus does give a joy and a peace that passes all understanding, but it's not a, I, we're, Christians should say we're, we're not always happy because that's an emotional, that's an emotional thing for the most part. 
but I'm always joyful because I know where my ultimate joy rests, and it's in him who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Jesus, right? And so I know where my joy rests. So what's the essence of how to begin to think biblically from the core? And I go to my, probably my favorite chapter in all the Bible, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read a portion of it to you tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because the goal that God is after is not that Christ is a way or a part of your life, that Jesus is a whole new way of living, that it, 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 he is the way, he is the life. And well, I know many people, especially, gosh, modern Northwesterners, people in Seattle, Tacoma, Puget Sound people, they would say, well, that's pretty exclusive, which is like the, the original sin of, you know, of, of our secular age, exclusivity. But I like to say, there's worse things than exclusivity, isn't there? There's worse things in life. Things could get worse than an exclusive truth claim. Well, what would that be? Being wrong. (laughs) There's worse things than asserting a truth claim, and that's being wrong. And that's one of my greatest fears as a as a man in the 21st century. If you ask, what's your greatest fear? I'd say my greatest fear is being wrong. What if I'm wrong? What if I'm not right? And that means I be, there, there's a lot that, go al- that could go along with that when you're wrong. Like life and death can happen when you're wrong, especially if you're in a position of great leadership and influence. You could, you could bring about a lot of pain and suffering and poverty and death when you're wrong. And so it's important that we search and examine and wrestle with, ask questions, to navigate and to locate the truth. So we need to be on truth quests, not happiness quests. And if you're agreeing with me about this, as you well better should, uh, because if you're on a happiness quest, that means you're gonna turn our society into a giant living hell that's just at the whims of your own desires to get what you want, you little tyrannical Stalinistic Hitler. That's what it turns into. Well, I'm serious. I mean, that's deadly stuff. Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 15. He begins with the importance of the resurrection. And in verses 3 to 7, Paul quotes the appearances of Jesus, how he appeared. And he lists six appearances, three to individuals and three to groups. There's probably more to that. But Paul is quoting here, as you've heard me mention, an, an ancient Christian creed that was probably formulated within a year or two Uh, Bart Ehrman, who's an atheist historian, New Testament scholar at North Carolina, says that this creed that Paul quotes in verses 3 to 5, yeah, probably 3 to 5, excuse me, 3 to 6, is at most 3 to 4 years after the the cross. To give you some perspective on that, 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 I just gave you material that's the center of the gospel that goes to 3 to 4 years after the cross in ancient literature. That's a pretty good source, you may say. Well, it's three to four years later. Well, the best source that we have for the life of Buddha is some 800 years after his life. Best source that we have for Alexander the Great, his name is, he's a historian named Arian, plus 350 years after his life. So so comparatively in ancient literature, this is pretty doggone good. And then Paul goes into, I want to go to verse 12. And listen, he says, but if Christ... But if it is preached that Christ has not been raised from the dead, then how can can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now listen, here, perk up. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. That's a pretty big statement because you know what he's saying about Christianity, the whole of the Christian faith, all of our hope, all of our dreams, all of our, our aspirations. It basically comes down to the question, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead or not? That's what he's saying, and, if, and look at, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Kind of makes my vocation a little bit superfluous, doesn't it? He calls it useless or vain. They would put Faith International University out of business if Christ has not been raised. It put a lot of people out of business. It put a lot, it, it put a lot of people in a precarious position if Christ has not been raised. Preaching, it's useless, so check this out. This is real interesting. If you, if you look at other major philosophies or world figures or religious figures, 
You couldn't say necessarily that a single event per se defines the truth or the falsity of the entire system. And Christianity says everything rests on this singular event. If it did not happen, none of it is true. And so you and, and he says if you just think it, it provides some comfort for this life, Paul says this later on in 1 Corinthians 15, as if it works for you, if it makes you happy, he says, if that's your mindset about Christianity, you all, among all people who have ever lived, are the most of everyone who's ever existed, the most to be pitied. That is the worst. The, that's a pretty bold, big statement, is it? We're to feel sorry for you people the most out of all people that have ever lived. Wow. If you believe Christ is raised and it's a hope only for this world, you're the most to say, to say man, I feel sorry for you. Isn't that interesting about Christianity? You could take other figures and you could still follow their way of life or their prescriptions for the way of life or an ethical system or a philosophical system. It's not predicated on the historicity of a single event. That's, the, that, that's why, Christi that's why I, I, I've, I've tried, I mean, in a very uh, modest sense to, to make all of my, my study about the, the historicity of that event. Because if it did occur, look at if Christ has been raised, then look at what happens. What if my mindset is, well, I just, I just believe we need to live the best life that we could possibly live, and when we die, that's all there is. Then th there's nothing. Well, if Christ has been raised, that viewpoint is wrong. And, and not only wrong, cosmically, eternally wrong. In other words, so if Christ has been raised, you can't think that way anymore. If Jesus Christ was historically raised from the dead, you can't think, well, at the end of life, I just hope, for, you know, that's just all there is, and we need to, you, you know, you're, you're Epicure live the best life you can now and live like an Epicurean and uh, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, and, you know, you only go around once, so have as much fun as you have. That's wrong if Christ has been raised from the dead. Can I put it more starkly than that? And it's deathly wrong. Well, what, okay, what if you think, well, like, that's to Nietzsche, <laughs> that there is nothing above us. If Christ historically was raised from the dead, I'm here to tell you, Nietzsche, you're dead and you're wrong. That's like I have that wonderful t-shirt that quotes Nietzsche on the cover. It says, God is dead, Nietzsche. And then underneath it, it says, Nietzsche is dead now, God. <laughs> How about this one? Well, I believe that we uh, need to live the best life that we can on earth, and the goal of life is just to be a good person, and, and hopefully that, that, that someday we will all be in the eternal soul, and we'll all be one, and... and based upon how well we lived in this life. If Christ was historically raised from the dead, that viewpoint is wrong. That means if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that means that on the cross he was doing the work of salvation for us, and in his resurrection, as Christ himself says, he says in Luke 24, he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures, and he says, is it not written that everything was written about me in the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets, that's the whole Old Testament, had to come true, that the, the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be preached to all the world in his name, and you are my witnesses of his things. If Christ has been raised, Jesus is right, the viewpoint that God helps those who help themselves or we're just supposed to live a good life is wrong. But here, you may say, exclusive. Well, it's just as exclusive as saying, well, if you live a good life, that, you, that, that that's, the goal of, and that's the goal of humanity is to live a good life and that one day we'll all be in this eternal bliss together, you know, roaming around. That's exclusive. Christianity has a spiritual worldview. Secularism has a spiritual worldview. We claim that there is no spiritual worldview, that there's nothing above us. Well, what is that? That's called an exclusive truth claim. I don't understand how people could say Christianity is exclusive and then posit a universal truth, truth claim on the hind end of that statement. <laughs> 
Well, isn't what you're saying exclusive? Well, no. Well, you're wrong. I mean, just see what I'm saying is that's, that's what I just did right there is, is in my mind, maybe very fallib, in a fallible way, how you think with a Christian mindset. If Christ has been raised, therefore, you see, so this is what Paul, this is what Paul is doing. If Christ has not been raised, we're all screwed. He even says in those, those uh, sorry about my language, but if, if, for, for those who have uh, put their hope in Jesus Christ, he says, those whom you love are eternally lost if Christ has not been raised from the dead. All those funerals we've went to, where we touch the casket, and we cry and we pray over those who trusted in Jesus, they're lost if Jesus has not been raised eternally. They're gone. That's a pretty morbid thought, isn't it? So you're starting to see that there's more that hangs on the resurrection of Jesus than just truth, but also life. Not just the truth of who we are, but what we're here for. And what is the purpose of life and joy and peace and even happiness? It all rests on predicated, did that man 2,000 years ago die on a cross and walked out three days later alive again. You know, it's fascinating, if you go read the Gospels, when the disciples and the women first saw the risen Jesus, they really didn't, do you know, do you know what they experienced first? Not, wonderful, this means they didn't, they didn't do what I just did. They didn't, they didn't think about, they, they, it was, here's why they didn't think about the consequences of it. Go read the Gospels, there's no like, theological interpretation of what Christ's resurrection meant. It took them probably a couple months, probably till Pentecost, right? To, oh my gosh, what does this mean? Because the Jews in that day had no conception of a resurrection in the present, right? They didn't have that. They thought the resurrection of the dead would be a general one at the end of time. They had no uh, worldview with which to understand a resurrection happening in the middle of time. They thought it would be at the end of time. And so here's the resurrected Jesus Christ never to die again. They didn't say, ah, this means life after death and the forgiveness of sins and salvation. Ha ha, yay! You get none of that in the Gospels. That comes later in the book of Acts and in Paul's, Paul's letters. Because do you know why they didn't know what to do with it? Because they were in abject terror. That's why they didn't know what to do with it. Utter fear, a dead man. And so they get to reflect on it. Because what, what they, when they looked at the cross, the disciples, and even the women, we like to say that the women were better than the men, you know, at the cross and with the res, when Jesus died. The men all ran and the women kind of hung by. Uh, they're better than the men. I concede your point. But that's a really low bar. <laughs> the, because that's like saying, at least I'm better than Hitler. That's a low bar, you guys. <laughs> at least I'm not in jail. Like, mom and dad, come on. At least I'm not doing drugs and, and I'm in jail. That's a low bar. <laughs> yes, the women were better than the men. But you know what? They went to the grave and they didn't ex the next Easter morning and they weren't expecting a resurrected Christ. Hmm. And so on Good Friday, there were no Christians. They looked, do you know how they interpreted Good Friday at the time? This man is not from God, he's a fraud. Or God has abandoned him because the Messiah is supposed to sweep the enemies away, not to be swept away by the enemies. That's why I'm saying, you guys, Christianity could never have been the, the, the product of an overactive first century Jewish mindset. Because furthermore, it's the most strictly monotheistic culture in the history of humanity, and out of that culture comes a movement that sweeps the entire globe that claims a man is God. You see, you see what I'm saying? Everything about Christianity goes against the viewpoint of what they thought about God. Cursed is every man who's hung on a tree, Deuteronomy says. So Jesus Christ was cursed by God when he's crucified. What's, it's over, it's done. But now that he rises from the dead, 
that you need to look at that. Was he cursed by God? Well, it looks like he was because he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible says, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. And now he stands in front of us alive. That means, oh my gosh, God vindicated what Jesus was doing on the cross. Now, it, that means, oh, if Jesus Christ was cursed on the cross, but God vindicated him by raising him from the dead, that means he, he, wasn't, he wasn't bearing his own curse. He was bearing someone else's. You see, oh, and this is why Paul picks this up in Galatians. Christ became a curse for us. You see how the resurrection gave the viewpoint for everything? And so, listen to Paul. For, let's wrap up. Paul says, um, verse 18, he says that if Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I love that. Jesus, what does the, the first fruits mean? Well, as Jesus Christ has been raised, those who put their faith and trust in him, this is what you're going to look like. You're going to follow in his victorious wake. So, and I, I love this. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, a couple of us were talking about this earlier. Je Jesus in his resurrected body, do you know he, he eats? He eats fish. Well, what's the lesson there? Uh, that in heaven, it's carnivore diet. Huh? No, that's not what it means. It means in heaven, you're going to eat. In heaven, it, the, it's, 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 it's not, it's not a, a restoration of the life that you lost here. It's a bestowing of the life that we've always pined for and never had that you will, that you will have eternally. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who, those who have fallen asleep. And he goes on. He says... Uh, Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Sweet, mild, nice, passive, right? Woke Jesus? I don't think so. <laughs> he says, what's the last thing Jesus Christ is going to do? He's going to destroy the great destroyer, you ever think about Jesus Christ that way? He's going to destroy all dominion, authority, and power. He's going to nuke everything. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So, I was talking with our resident theologian in, my, in our house. His name is Chance. He's our youngest kid. And... He had a couple of interesting questions this, this week. He says, my friends tell me at school when you're 65, you have to retire. And he says, when are you going to retire, Dad? And I said, I need a haircut because I'm showing too much gray on the sides right now. And he's determining that I'm getting close to that 65. So I got a haircut, as you can see. Um, but that's not the issue I wanted to bring up, but because I, I told him, you know, there's a difference between having a job and having a vocation. A vocation is a calling. That's what the Latin word means, vocatio. And a job is something you do for a paycheck. A vocation is something you do whether or not you get a pay, whether you get a paycheck or not. And I think those of us who, uh, we should all be working for the Lord, whether you're standing up here with me or you're sitting where you are now. You should ha all have vocations, not jobs. And God has put your feet there to serve him and, and, and to not glorify yourself and just get a paycheck. There's nothing wrong with getting a paycheck. I'm not saying that. But God has given you vocations. Those are callings. And you know what you do with callings? You never retire. Never. Now, I get it. Like, when my 20 years in the Navy are up, I'm going to retire out of the Navy, but the vocation of why you were serving in the Navy, that calling, will, is you, you never retire from. His second point, he says, well, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he has defeated all the powers, Chance then said, astutely enough, why does it look like none of the powers are defeated? Right? Because there's still death. 
There's still pain. There's still suffering. And in his case, there's still bad grades um, and missed layups. Why isn't everything bliss? That's a good question, isn't it? And I took him to Martin Luther, and, and Luther said, when Christ rose from the dead, he cut the devil's head off. But have you ever seen a chicken with its head cut off? Unfortunately, I have, by my hick grandpa who did it in front of me. I watched, uh, <laughs> I watched the chicken with its head cut off run around for a solid, whatever, 30 seconds, which was to a nine-year-old little Danny quite traumatizing. To, to, to running around with its head cut off, and I was just going. <laughs> you, do you want to know why I felt that way, traumatized? Because things shouldn't run around with their gosh darn head cut off. That's why. <laughs> and so I said, but that's what, God, that's what Jesus did to the devil. That's what Jesus did to sin. That's what Jesus did, has accomplished on the cross. I said, now he's cut its head off, but it still gets to run around for a little bit. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, we're in the running around phase, even though the head's cut off. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, and finally, the last thing that Jesus is going to do with the chicken, with its head cut off that's running around, stomp its guts out finally so that it stops running around. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Hmm. Well, how do I know that Jesus Christ has accomplished all this? And how, see, this is how you start to look at all the Scripture. This is how you start to look at all, the, all, all of your life through the lens of the resurrection of Jesus. I hope that's making sense. How is Jesus going to do this? I like to say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the receipt of a proof of purchase. Kim and I like to go to Costco. Now that we've been married 14 years, that's like a fancy, sexy date. And... When you go to Costco, and I dare you to buy any, to come out with anything under $300, when you go to Costco and you have, you get this long receipt, right? And they funnel you through uh, this exit system. And pretty soon you find yourself at the front of the line and there is this tyrannical gatekeeper who says, show me the receipt! <laughs> and Sometimes you put it in your pocket or you figure, you start fumbling for the receipt. You can't find the receipt. Well, then you're in big, it's not usually that tyrannical, but you know, sometimes you get a smiley face on your receipt. But nonetheless, show me the, show me the receipt. And you could produce, when, if you have it, you could say, back off, tyrannical gatekeeper. I have my receipt. And then they will say, you are correct. Paid in full. You're free to go. And off we go to our cars with our Costco. This is exactly how the resurrection is. How do you know your debt has been paid in full? How do you know the worries, the anxieties, your impending death, the death of your loved ones, how do you know that that's been taken care of? You know what Jesus Christ is? He's your Costco, the resurrection, it's your Costco receipt. Those things that have demands on you, your sin, the world, Satan, how do you know? How do you know that's been paid in full? And you could bring up the resurrection of Jesus and you could say, back off, I have the receipt. My debt is paid in full, so back off. Can I share with you one more story? Is that okay? Because we're going to pray and then, we'll, get, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cut you loose. We'll check your receipts at the door. <laughs> I've told this story before, but I'll conclude with this. Promise. Back in 2015, I was on a period of active duty, and some of you know this story, so don't, don't jump my punchlines. Um, some of you do that, and that really irritates me. Uh, so back in 2015, I was on uh, active duty up at uh, the shipyard, up at the Navy shipyard up at Bremerton. And I was filling in for one of the chaplains there, and one day, this uh, enlisted woman, she, she walks into my office, uh, kind of frumpy looking, and with her, with her cover on, and it's like cockeyed and everything, so I'm like, who is this soup sandwich that just walked into my office? Well, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I was trained 
by, marine, by a marine drill instructor. And so you, you get your uniform squared away and some of these Navy folk, they look, as, they look as disheveled as you could possibly imagine. It's like, do you look at yourself in the mirror? You know? Uh, so anyways, she's like, oh, hey, can I talk? And I was like, I said, first of all, you're indoors. Take your cover off. Right? So she takes her cover off. And I almost said, and you're, you're, you're an E3. Um, I'm a lieutenant commander. It's sir. You know, I didn't say that. Um, because when you're a chaplain, you don't, you don't want that stuff. But I just tell you, there wasn't a lot of military decorum is my point. So we sit down and we start talking. And she informs me that she was in this uh, credit card scam where some guy had been calling her, you know, you get the, at least Apple now says scam likely, but this, this guy had been calling her and, you know, they were, became in love and he convinced her to give him all of her credit card data and he took it and obviously did what? Whatever, you, what you could imagine is he maxed it out and, and it was all in this international scheme and she was freaked out because, First of all, I was like, I almost blurted out. I was like, you can't be that dumb. Okay. Um, that's not very pastoral. So, and she, was, and she was hurting over it because she was scared to tell her unit, her command, because she thought she would get a, she thought she'd get maybe kicked out of the Navy, certainly get NJP'd. And so she goes, I don't know what to do. I, and I have a kid, and I don't, and, and I'm so, she came to the chaplain because it's, it's, it's confidentiality without, it can't, it never, well, I guess it's leaving me now. It can never, uh, <laughs> I had her permission. No, so that's different. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the reason she came to me is that because I have no obligation to say anything. I can't say anything to anyone. So that's why. That's why you have chaplains there. Because if you tell your command, or anyone in your command, they're obligated to tell this, the, the chain. So, I didn't know what to do, so I, whatever, this is what I do when I don't know what to do. I just read the Bible. So we read Psalm 40 and prayed. And after we finished Psalm 40, these are my notes I'm reading right here. I said, she put her head down and then she said, I have to tell my command. I didn't say anything. She said that. She comes back, this, these are my notes, she comes back the next day happy, dot, 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 very happy. She told her command and it's going to be okay. But she said to me, quote, but I don't think I'm okay yet. And I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, I want to know more about what we read yesterday. This is verbatim now. We read John chapter 1 the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing has come into being that has come into being. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of every person. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became a human being in flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory is of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. I read that. Before I could finish that last sentence, full of grace and truth, she stopped me and she said, I get it. He's to be my purpose in my life. As a matter of fact, he is my life now. And I could go into peace and a new life through him. And then she prayed. For the first time in her life, she said. She said, I get it. I'm okay. He's my life now. And she walked out. Never saw her again. True story. No, no uh, homiletical embellishment. No sermon embellishment there. That's, that's how you take who Jesus is and you apply it to how you live. Mm. That woman, disheveled, her uniform, looking like a soup sandwich, all bound up, walked out as clean and as organized and as squared away in the Lord, which is way more important than being squared away for Uncle Sam, as squared away in the Lord as anyone I've ever met. That's, that's what the Lord is in the business of. 
So, Father, we thank you, and we ask that you, uh, Lord, give us, uh, give us vision and strategy to think and to look at our lives, especially as we sang this morning, look at our, look at our lives how you see our lives. As we sang this morning, I am chosen, I am not forsaken, I am who you say that I am. We thank you, Father, that you disagree with us, that you, who you say we are, that's who we are. It doesn't matter what our culture says, doesn't matter what our parents said or our coach said, doesn't matter what we say about ourselves, we are who you say we are. For we know, Father, that when your son Jesus sets us free, we're free indeed, we're children of God, Yes, we are. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to do something kind of unique. It's hard to transition out of that. Thank you for that, Pastor Dan. Amen. So helpful information, isn't it? We need that reminding. Um, John and I felt because of what's been happening, we talked about a few weeks ago, Asbury, the revival happening, right? We have noticed that the theme of all the places that are breaking out with revival is the young adult. So we want to just really quickly do something kind of special. Um, we want to call all of you that are in high school, well, because the children's are down in the children's right now, right? So if you are a teenager up through 30 years old, we want to invite you very quickly to come and stand right here because we want to, as a church, um, partner with what God's doing. He's highlighting this age group. What's happening is the revival is being ushered and led by, you know, 17 to 25 year olds right now. So let's partner with what God's doing. So if you are that age, will you just be courageous? Just come all together. Just come quickly. Come quickly. Because we want to end on time if we can. So we want to honor everyone here's time. And then if you've been asked to be today's prayer team, would you come up to just line up right here, young people. If you are 13 to 30 years old, come up, come, come, come. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yes. 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 We just want to, as a church, we want to pray a blessing over you. And as, as awkward as it might be, would you look, this is your church. This is your family of God people right here. Okay? Receive 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 what they're about to sing over you and church sing like never before okay and if you want to stand you're going to reach a hand however you want to do it let's do it let's bless these young people and you know we acknowledge that this is a hard time to be your age right it's confusing isn't it it's hard it's hard at school it's hard with your friends it's just hard and we know, we want you to know we are there for you. We are here for you. If you want to wrestle through privately talking through stuff, the hardest of questions, the simplest of things, this is your family of God. We're here for you, okay? Amen. So prayer team, um, you might feel, young people, a, a friend come and lay a gentle hand on your shoulder. We just want them to pray over you. So just receive it and be willing and open, okay? Amen. Let's pray. to you.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his never-ending peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord.